السلام علیکم دوستو گڈ ایوننگ گڈ مارننگ ٹو فرینڈس اینڈ ایڈیٹور فیملی ممبرز ویر ایور یو آر ان دا ورلڈ ہوپ یو آر ویل ویلکم ٹو لائف چیٹ نمبر فورٹی ٹو ٹوڈے ویر گوئنگ ٹو بی ٹاکنگ کائنڈ آف آرکیٹیکچرل ہسٹری اٹس گوئنگ ٹو بی کلونیل ہسٹری دیٹ از ووون ان ٹوگیدر ود این اربن لینڈ اسکیپ اینڈ اسپیشلی ویر گوئنگ فوکس آن کراچی بیکاز دیٹس دا سٹی دیٹ آئی نو بیسٹ And it would be a wonderful case study because all of us can also relate to that. Many of us, in fact, were on here. So we're going to look at one random uh, building and a um, very sensitive, fantastic ecosystem that lives all around it and has done for many years. We're going to look at the Frere Hall and I'm going to just discuss it with uh, Jean Gardner and see what she thinks, having lived for many, many years in New York and knowing the history of all the parks there, whether it's the Brooklyn Park, Prospect Park, Uh, the park on Staten Island or even the Great Central Park. So I think it should be an interesting conversation for today uh, for all of us to learn from in terms of what our roles and responsibilities are for Frere Hall, uh, what Frere Hall provides us with, what it provides the public with and who is responsible for really its caretaking uh, responsibilities, who's the real custodian, what kind of work should be done, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, what, what does it really mean to have that kind of heritage site bang in the middle of our city with this gorgeous garden all around it and lots of different types of people using it at all times. So Jean is here, let's say hello to her. This is our book for today. For those of you who live in Karachi, you can go buy this. Hello, Jean. Hi, hello. What do you have? A uh, book on Karachi. Yep, a book on Karachi seemed appropriate, the dual city. How are you doing? I'm doing good, very good. Always happy at one o'clock on the Eastern seaboard of the turtle continent to be talking to you nearly halfway around the earth. And that alone is such a miracle. such an unexpected thing. How else could I be? We are all happy to have you with us, sharing your time with us, and now hopefully sharing some ideas about this phenomenal building that is our case study to discuss for today. It's a magnificent Frere Hall with his neo-Gothic architecture and its 13, 15 acre property around it. Uh, which everybody uses. You know, the, one day I'm hoping that when you come to Karachi, we'll go and spend some time there and just sit there and people watch. It's in many ways, it's like Washington Square Park where there's so much going on and you can just sit back and watch it. You know, there's families that come by for picnics. There's young photographers that are testing their cameras and doing assignments for university. There are uh, wedding portraits being done after the wedding. It's really quite beautiful. There's, there's some light dating that happens, people are making friends with each other. Uh, and sometimes just families would come out because they need some fresh air and some green and they live in really congested um, homes, small cramped apartments in the inner city. Sometimes they don't have power. So it's just this great little place for the spot. And really it's this amazing, like essentially an urban sanctuary for humans who, who need a break and who need some fresh air. So knowing you, you've probably done a little bit of research on it. <laughs> well, That's a magic word, searching. searching again, searching for something that I have lost. And from what you've told me about the possible future of Frere Hall and the gardens around it. So it just seems to be really an opportunity Like I see Michelle is listening, a wonderful student who worked on Riverside Park on an area that was very beloved, but was suffering from runoff and basically mud coming from higher up the hill. So she can think about Riverside Park. Everybody, I really encourage everybody listening to realize that what Zen is describing to us, what do you know from your own experience? So I'm hoping Zen, you'll tell us a little more about what's there. 
Um, in terms of what's actually there, as, other than the building and the gardens. And so the people. You mentioned people. people. It's really, it's, into so, it. you know, I think unlike many of the other ancient sites that we visit and we study, uh, the sites inside Karachi have a completely different character and they play a different role in the urban life. And Frere Hall itself is one of those unique public spaces. It's a park that's green, that's got lots of ancient trees. And by ancient, I mean over 100 years old. It's got old, tall trees that provide shade, that provide a space for people to come and sit and read underneath. Sometimes in the hot summer days, people will take their lunch break from neighboring jobs, neighboring offices, and come and rest there for half an hour, close, some, close their eyes, and just relax for 30 minutes, 45 minutes before they go back. They'll bring their packed lunches with them. Sometimes there's students who come there and they have group meetings, group, group discussions. Some of them will sit inside the library, which is there in the ground floor. Some, while they're waiting for the group to gather, will go upstairs and see the see the gallery, see Sadatayan's mural on the, view, on the ceiling, which is absolutely spectacular, even though it's incomplete. So it's a really great space for different types of people to gather, the minorities, the marginalized, the people who are, some of them are just single and you know just need to go someplace where they can sit and see others and not be judged. Um, and it's, it's, an, it's also amazing because in a city like Karachi, you would imagine that all this mixture of these ethnicities and the, you know it's multi-gender, uh, whether it's male, female, transgender, or other who are there, nobody bothers each other. Nobody steps into each other's privacy. Nobody's uh, encroaching on each other's space. There's this silent understanding between all of them that this is our shared environment, our shared sanctuary. And there's no violence. There are no muggings. There's nothing stolen. There's no no physical abuse or harassment. And there's people who sit there, like I said, some will come in the afternoons, on weekends, there's a book fair that happens on Sundays. So there'll be people who'll be there loitering, just safe, easy loitering, killing time, thinking, trying to solve personal issues, trying to solve issues at home. Sometimes they're there to meet friends, to solve, mar mar to solve marital problems or you know issues with children who may be special needs. It's, a, it's an incredible space in terms of the kind of conversations you can run into, the, the beautiful magical collisions that you have with people that really there's no other place to meet because we don't have bars and nightclubs and community centers of that nature. It's a, it's a very closed, conservative, stratified society. So Frere Hall's garden just breaks all those rules and it's so, so truly humanely democratic. It's unbelievable. Well, then what's the, well, how is it a case study? I mean, really, what is it that's happening that would stop this very important dynamic in the city that you described, which is actually can be connected. The word public can be connected to democracy. That word is very new in the bigger picture. But you juxtaposed it in our topic for today to the word ish uh, ancient so mm. so it's what's what is making you think about it what's making it on your mind and why you've been telling me about it so it's a it's a uh, about a year ago and maybe it's, it had been brewing but a year ago it really came to the surface that there was um, a group of uh, private businessmen who had you know, created a uh, agreement with the local municipality body who's, who's, who are supposed to be the administrators and the caretakers, and the custodians of all of Karachi, whether it's the sewage or its heritage sites. And Frere Hall has several custodians. So, you know, it has a park. So the parks and recreation people are involved. There's incredible trees. So the forestry ministry involved. Of course, the municipality is there. And of course, it sits in a, it sits in a major city, one of the country's major cities. So the provincial government also has a say in it. So it's got these really sort of diverse folks looking at it. And then this private sector uh, team came in and they said, you know, you guys are not doing anything, so why don't we? Which is such a great idea. I would love to have more of the private sector engage and activate their resources, their intellect, their creativity with the government bodies, because I think the government bodies need help. A lot of times people will say they're untrained. Well, educate them, help them, talk to them, give, share the information. They're not going to be born 
educated. And a lot of times these people, you know, they're well-meaning. They're uh, Many times they're good souls. They just don't know what the right thing to do is. And sometimes the best of intentions don't necessarily give the best of results because, you know, the, the culture of the environment has maybe not been studied. The data may not have been collected. And and the this team that's come in and said that, you know, we can do things are suggesting things that many of us think are not necessarily the right way to go, whether it's fencing the whole place up or putting ticket ticketing the gates. Right now it's free for all. Anybody can come in. You don't pay anything to go inside. Um, you know, they're wanting to add spaces to it. For instance, for example, um, you know, in an early master plan, there was a discussion that maybe there should be an amphitheater there. There's no need for an amphitheater in an environment like this. It's got two major arteries of roads on either side. We have other amphitheaters in the city that nobody uses. They're not being used all year. We have a performing arts um, center that takes care of all the theater and performance art activities. There's an art council, so you know, there's that. Then there was some like suggestion for maybe we should have an underground parking. Now, underground parking in an environment where you will be digging through the gardens, which are essentially heritage trees and heritage gardens. I mean, fine, they were designed at some point, fixed at some point back then, but this is their present condition today. And, you know, who knows what, what the digging into that earth through heavy machinery might do to the foundations of the actual town hall, Frere Hall, or some of the colonial buildings in the neighborhood. Stin Club is right there. Flagstaff House is just at the back. You know, the, the other old colonial mansions just down that road. I, I would be cautious about wanting to put in an underground parking under a building that's, you know, potentially an antiquity site and taken care of by the culture department. So, um, you know, it's, it's, there's so many people that are players in this game. And I like the idea that the private sector has come forward and said, let's do something. I'm not so sure if what they're thinking about is as helpful to the space as it could be. Um, you know, another library, we have a library there, just populated with more books. The gallery upstairs needs work, sure. Roof needs fixing, sure. Uh, does it need restrooms over there? Public, well-kept, maintained, paid restrooms? Yes. Should people have access to free water? For sure. So it's not that nobody should come and touch it, but I, I just, and I'm not the only one. There's, there's a lot of others like me in civil society, um, professionals who live in the city, who feel like, they could also give their input and share some ideas to help make sure that whatever work is done is done sensitively, humanely, and without disrupting its present culture of the public, the mixed public that does use it every day, even now. For me, you've touched so many familiar issues that seem to me extremely important in a city like Karachi, which is so clearly on the verge of private interests taking over public spaces. And the voices that aren't being heard sound like they're the same people who now use that open space. In other words, there are all these people with opinions, all with very important contributions, but what about the people who normally don't have access? Like I saw an excerpt from a talk you gave on the rights of Karachi. Well, wow, I mean, it's one thing to talk about the rights of common, you know, an elephant or, you know, the rights of immigrants. I mean, in other words, there are a lot of conversation about rights. Black lives matter here in the United States. But to say that a city has rights, and you also went on and you said public spaces have rights. Yes. Yeah, you know, so in effect, you're extending what those people who have a voice, and you and I are extremely lucky at this point in time that every Monday 
we can step away from the onslaught of so much that we can't really do much about. But the place where we live, the city, the village, the street, sidewalks, sidewalks are public spaces. And you've shown me pictures of what happens in very extensively in Karachi when it rains. You know, not even the streets are available for safe passage. So to have what you describe as a effort by a select group of people to decide what this one public space, not more than 13, 14, 15 acres, which is so stunning, even from the photographs, will have a fence around it, charge tickets, wants to put in an amphitheater. These are struggles that are going on everywhere. So I think it's really important to everyone listening to us now or hopefully later to think of something in your quote backyard in effect that is in the midst of what we call in English eminent domain. Now I don't know whether they have a law like that in Karachi but in the United States you may not want a private group of very important influential people to declare eminent domain and they can take from you things that you value and you have no, no voice in deciding. So that, what we call gentrification, making places that are available to everybody fit a, well, of course, the word in English, gentra, the gentry, those who in the past have had power and have made so many decisions. This is, this is a dynamic in the midst of what for a long time people held as an, as an evolutionary dynamic, democracy. But anybody, those listening are, I know, are fully aware of this. We all know that democracy is being threatened. And there are plenty of places that are in the headlines internationally. But where we can make a difference, where we live. And I think that's what's so important about understanding not just the building. We've been using this word ancient, which I will give Zen full credit for. <laughs> that ancient and heritage, those are words. Don't you all see them in light? Every, every, I use it all the time. Okay, so my point being, then somebody might say, oh, that's a really old building. Oh, look, the ceiling's unfinished in the gallery. Oh, the library's not really being used. Let's change it. So that's saying ancient is something from the past. And I think it's critical to understand that we aren't using the word ancient, meaning something in the past. It's existing right here, right now. And imagine anything that you know from a tree that's very old to a building, to uh, jewelry, to clothing, to a recipe, to music that was m created a long time ago, but now it's still existing in the present. And we're all looking for support at this minute when so much is being threatened by groups of people who, for whatever reason, they're absolutely welcome, but let's listen to each other. So I'm, I'm very curious. You mentioned an amphitheater. You have told me that it will probably affect the roots of these trees. There's no question. 
There's no question. If these trees are, I mean, how, how, how old? Do you know when they were first planted? Do you have any idea how old the trees are? At least as old as the building. So okay. there, there may be some trees older, but I mean, 100 years is probably an easy guess. So the roots are going to be all intertangled, which they should be. Very interesting that tree roots are strengthened by intertangling with other tree roots in just the same way you talked about people coming together in a public space, a public park, and then their dynamics begin to make a web that's interdependent. You know, it's like going and sitting in a cafe, like you mentioned about sitting in the park alone, but you go, I go there because I'm part of the humming noise you know, somebody may flirt with me and I'll say, yeah, you, let's go for it. In other words, it's like social life of roots of trees is no different than social life of humans. So those trees, the idea of moving them, when they, it's only English romantic poetry that stands a tree alone and the whole rise of the individual as somebody who stands alone, those are myths. So public spaces, the trees, the grass, the seasons, the smells, all the things that happen there. But what is happening around it? It would be my question. So like in the case of the parks that I know, Central Park, all the parks in the city, all of what the person who created the whole park system in the United States, and then internationally, Frederick Law Olmsted, what these parks mean to the context is really important. So I'm just curious, what is the context that might lead to a proposal that isn't going and sitting on a bench with somebody in the park, people on that, and saying, well, why do you come here? What's valuable about it? You use it all the time. So what's the bigger context? Can we get any clues about why this might be happening right now? So that's an interesting question. Um, so Frere Hall and its gardens, um, the buildings around it, there's one whole row that has Flagstaff House at one corner, which was a Jinnah's house by the Azams, Muhammad Ali Jinnah's house. And then there's a series of these stunning uh, colonial mansions all along that road. Um, that takes you all the way up to the old Kent station, the railway station, which is again a real junction for everybody coming in and out of Karachi. So that whole row, on the other side, there's banks, there's a hotel, there's the old uh, Neutra building, the old American Council building, so another heritage site right across from this. At one of its shorter ends is a, a complex of buildings, beautiful, again, old colonial buildings in excellent condition that are being used which is a members-only high-end club, the Spin Club. And then there's a few residences on the other side. So it's a, it's a prime property in terms of many things about Karachi that you can learn. Um, but what's, what's magnificent about it is that people who don't live there, who come from the outside, it's, it's, an, it, it's a city tourist destination as well. But even people who live in the city, they come here, they will take a bus or a taxi or their own bikes, and a lot of motorcycles you'll see and small cars. People from the middle class and the lower income class will come here from different parts of the city because for them, it's a, it's a beautiful, gorgeous, glamorous space. And they're not necessarily from that neighborhood. The people that live in that neighborhood, in fact, would not go here. They would go to the club or they'd go out of town or they'd get on a jet and go to some you know, exotic land somewhere else for a beach. So the people that actually live around it are not the users of the space. The users of the space are tourists that come to it from other, like, um, other parts of the city. And it's interesting because when you see them, you feel the energy. You see, you understand the term human heritage, that there is a culture here that has always nurtured this kind of a society within the volume of the garden and the building. That's what it's always emanated. And for it to suddenly become a, a isolated incident or devoid of this kind of a life, devoid of its 
present human heritage and culture and society that lives in it, lives around it, would be almost like thinking of it like a, just a commodity, a commodity to sell on the stock market or something to commodify and say, this is, this is X, Y, Z in black and white numbers. This is its value if you do this to it. This is its value if you do this. If you make these changes, its value will go up and the property in the neighborhood will suddenly become higher value. But that commodification, which you said is gentrifying it, I think is commodifying it because they're looking at the bottom line and saying, what is all of this, these 15 acres worth in terms of top dollar? So I can see that, I understand that. But you know, we have, we have such a dearth of spaces with this kind of a culture, with this kind of a living present human heritage happening when nobody bothers each other, places where minorities can go and they're safe, it's a safe space for women, for children, for anybody else who is not seen or forgotten, for the voiceless in the humans, in human society, this is a great place for them to go. Sometimes they go for, as a social activity to make new friends. And they do make new friends. We have wonderful stories. Uh, societies will meet there, you know, little communist societies will meet there and other sort of avant-garde people doing art and poetry will meet there. Poetry, old poetry society will meet there. And the younger free flowing types will also meet there. So artists come together, musicians come together, filmmakers will test work. We have so many places in Karachi that are derelict, that are in, in inner city congested environments that are derelict parks. They need to be cleaned up to be re-energized, to have money invested in them all over the city. This park needs barely just a few sensitive touches to it to complete its restoration. But it's a functioning space. And you know how they say, don't fix what's not broken. <laughs> so the fixing process is potentially going to break something. And what it'll break is not only what's happening there, but it'll also break the voice of the civic civil society who is saying, we don't want this. And if you override that, how unfair is that? Well, it's not only a question of, or what is it that unfair means? Mm. And I think that you're taking the context beyond the immediate one, where it's so obviously clear that it's a very uh, incredible context in terms of heritage buildings, which are both clubs and offices and homes, and then as well, new accommodations for the people who can take the highway in from the airport or arrive on the train. So there's a whole district or what we in the United States call a landmark area. And that's one way that open spaces, public spaces and buildings that all belong together are safe and also their value understood. Because I think it's really important to take a minute to understand the effect on the human spirit of places like you just described, not as a, not solely as a place for tourists to go or people from the bigger city of Karachi, but to ask ourselves beyond the, the kind of sociability and the effects of being under the trees, on the grass, in a place that is clearly different than any place else in the city, but what are the, the effects on a person's spirit and how do they measure up those effects in relationship to keeping the area exclusively for those who can pay for the fees. There's one place in New York City that comes right to mind right in back of the New York City Public Library, right on Fifth Avenue and between Fifth Avenue and Sixth Avenue on 42nd Street. So you couldn't get more what's considered the center of the city. Oh, yes. was, was at one time a um, reservoir. 
Now, nobody has ever proposed, you know, that we should dig up the reservoir. But it was filled in and became a park. And it was a park that was accessible to everybody. It's raised up. And I think the, uh, at one point, the library stacks extended underneath. It became a gathering place for people who made other people using the space nervous because they weren't the same. And this has happened again and again in the evolution of New York City. Oh, instead of talking to someone who makes you nervous just because they're sitting on the fence and they don't look like you, people began to figure out, well, how can we exclude them? Exclude them. And Herbert Mushan, a former critic of the New York Times, he wrote about those people who felt nervous as the business class. So they redid Bryant Park and there's a raised area uh, for a restaurant. So that means you have to have money to eat there. So that's why he called it the business class. Now there's a lower area with some tables and chairs and often those are taken away. And if there's a holiday coming, there's all these little shops put in. So again, it's you got to have money to be there. My point being, we can keep gentrifying, we can keep pushing the market value, the commodity of open space by pushing everybody who doesn't fit that pattern out. But what does that do to the human spirit? What does that do if you're in any one of these different categories when you're all human beings. So I'm just curious because this, um, for those of you who don't, uh, you probably guessed, I did my thesis in graduate school on Frederick Olmsted, who is the first person to create a democratic open space. He was influenced by what he saw in England, but those were not democratic and also in France, the Bois de Bologna. So he thought long and hard and wrote, thank God, very proliferally, is that the right word? Wrote a lot about what I just was asking again for each of you to think about, but for uh, Zen, I mean, why do you care about this place? Why spend a whole hour with me talking about something I care about and tried to get everybody else involved. What? What is it for you? For well, you? One, one hour today and three hours yesterday and many hours with others in the last 48 hours and many more hours a year ago when this uh, proposal came to surface. So it's a landmark that plays a really uh, sentimental role in my childhood. I used to drive wow every day on my way to school. And sometimes we'd stop and we used to have these orange icicles, like ice lollies, and we would coerce the chauffeur who was taking, you know, there's a group of us in the car, four of us, to just stop so we could sit under the tree, have our ice lollies, because otherwise in the car, it would spoil our clothes and there would be dead giveaway that had these on the way home. So it would, we would use that as an excuse to jump out of the car and just, you know, be silly for just 10 minutes before, and early in the morning, I would drive past and there would be elderly ladies and elderly gentlemen doing Tai Chi or Tai Chi type exercises, walking. So in winter, you'd see the dew across the grass um, and on the pitch roof of the building. So it's, uh, I, and you know, through the, in the afternoon, it'd be the people from either, either the railway station, the offices in the evenings, it would be the folks going out for just an evening out. So over the course of the day, the culture of the space changes. And, I just think that it is such a symbolic um, icon of the city's democratic mm. system. I would hate to have that exclusivity take away such a vital piece of democracy from our hands, which is, if nothing else, enough reason to keep it there. Certainly, I don't use it on a daily basis like many others do. But if there's somebody who is going to put in a lot of money 
to fix what's not broken, they're bound to expect that money back. That type of philanthropy is unheard of, where somebody will just drown such a large amount of money on such a massive project and then not expect any ROI, which is return on their investment. I mean, especially because the people who are getting involved in this project are uh, shrewd businessmen and very successful humans. Um, and, you know, more power to them. But one does, one does question that if somebody's going to put in this much money, how are they ever going to make it back? So there must be a business model that explains how the impact of investing and gentrifying and de-democratizing this space is going to be a terrific kickback in somebody's financial bottom line. So apart from the damage, this heavy handed kind of gentrification will do to the Frere Hall grounds and its culture and its living human heritage, it's not a building inside the Met. You know, it's not a building that exists in isolation to its society or in isolation to its people. It's very much integrated in its people, its culture, its society, all those people that the top 1% doesn't really engage with, but they engage with each other. So I would, I, I, that's what worries me. And that's my love for it is it's always been this symbolic, it's a gorgeous building, it's neo-Gothic. And I think that everybody should have access to it. We should, it should become part of our program where we take people there and look at its proportions and its materiality and its construction technology. One of my students a few years ago did a project where the attic was used as her site for a spa and a meditation center. <laughs> and hello. and uh, there's a tail that's come to join me. Here we go. <laughs> Somebody who thinks all of this is entirely boring. <laughs> so, you know, it's a space that represents a lot of our history, a lot of cultural history that I think is worth holding on to and not monetizing and not uh, de-democratizing either. So for me, it's a, um, it's a place that I love for all of these different reasons. And it always makes me smile when I drive past and I see, you know, 15 acres, you can easily house 1,000, 2,000 people there and you won't even feel, you won't even feel how crowded it is. So it's really wonderful to drive past that and say, look at these people given, this is resilience. This is their resilience. That given how tough their lives are and how questionable the administration is of the city, too many players, too many cooks in the kitchen, here are people who still come out and they enjoy life and they have a right to enjoy the fresh air. They have a right to those trees. They have a right to free space. They have a right to something free because most things that they pay for, they don't even get So here. At least they're getting what they're coming for. And it's quite mag magical. Why, why should anybody take that away from them? I'm going to do what you do every time you chat. Uh oh. <laughs> I am going to ask you to <coughs> go what I would call deeper. Go deeper. Yes. In other words, wonderful. And I hope everyone who's listening will do the same thing. The pleasure you've just described, all the multiple ways, and you're truly mystified why anyone would want to rid Karachi of these pleasures that aren't class-based, that bring people into what you used the word early on, what we might call a civil society, as opposed to a monetized, these are just big words, where capital, where money, is the measure. So what, what, how does it affect your spirit? So in other words, yes, pleasure, but going into your own body and really, if you can, the feelings are still there. Those feelings of not, you, you play, you know, I can just see, the dripping from these popsicles and what joy all of you had hoping it might spill over your uniform <coughs> and then your moms, you know, would 
be, ah, what am I going to do with you? And you will think, ah, everything's life is worth it. They can't say should to me anymore because <coughs> I get my popsicles. Okay, that's pleasure, pure pleasure. And children are so close to it. But even more, things that are in another, other different experiences now that you're grown up, but all through your lifetime, coming back to Karachi, coming back there. I, I, I'm sorry, I can't think of any other word, but deeper, deeper at, to the feelings, the um, why it is in the pandemic now when some of the restrictions are being lifted. Plus, in the northern part of the earth, northern, having to do with what we call the North Star, people, it's, it's summer. So everyone's going out. And where do they want to go? They want to go to the beach. They want to go to the national parks. They want to go and eat on the sidewalk next to the street, if possible, eat on the street. I think there's 60 some streets now that New York City is saying we're not gonna ever have cars back there. Just going and sitting under a tree. My apartment in New York City on Broadway is near a little triangular park. We just flock there whenever there's an opportunity just for those trees. And I know the earth itself is not under there, but the trees are ancient. They were part of an earlier uh, vacation house outside the limits of New York City. So it's, it's, there's something magnetic about open spaces, particularly like we see in prayer hall, the space around it, that have living plants. I'm sure there are all kinds of little creatures living in those plants. You could hear them if you can't see them. But even where it's, it's a paved area, like a sidewalk or a street, if people have, have until now had the opportunity to just go there. So my, my, what, I, what I'm digging for, and you may not have the words, so next time you're gonna have to have a drawing to explain this to us. But you know, I'm, I'm really saying Make a sound, make some gesture that expresses like you walk into, any of you, you walk into a place that's what we're describing. And what happens to your, you know, to your body when you take a, you know, you know you're away now in the pandemic here, you're away from a lot of noise. I understand from what you say, there are roads right around the edges of it. But even if there are, there's a lessening of noise. I've sat underneath a tree, a very old tree in Union Square Park, which is much closer to busy streets than what you're describing. And all of a sudden you're not there anymore. So what, what is the body doing? when it responds. So I think, I think I will come back to another one of my favorite words. And you said, you know, create a, what would the gesture be? So, you know, the gesture would really be with an arms, eyes closed, and you just float. The body surrenders to this environment. There is a decrease in noise. It doesn't go away because they're busy streets. But I think that as a member of civil society, when I go there as a foreigner in my own city, as a tourist, that's more of a tourist than the others because the others come there regularly. It's an open community center for all of them. When I go there, I'm much more of an outsider, much more of the other. And many of them who are regulars there, who have fixed times during the day, during the week, they will be, they will be heads that look around and wonder who you are. There's never, any hostility or animosity or rejection. 
they're all inclusive. Arms will open and they will let you walk by. They will offer you their lunch. They will offer you their tea and you don't want it. So it's got a familial nature to it just intuitively. Yeah. Yeah. And the trees, the grass, maybe it's not in the best condition. There's stray dogs that'll be loitering around. Nobody bothers the dogs. The dogs don't bother anybody. Of course, there's cats and there's mice and there's birds. The trees are filled with nests and birds. I just feel like as a member of the civil society that we all have a voice that we should be able to use and should be heard by the administration, the different people involved as custodians of this building. And even, even the young, the new, well-intentioned uh, private group who's coming in to say, we'd like to fix the unbroken and mm -hmm. develop it for whatever, whatever uh, is on their agenda, our voices should still be heard and um, taken into account. And by our, I don't just mean mine and my friends, my professional friends, but you know, the people that use the garden, do they know what's happening or what might happen? or what somebody else from the outside is looking at. You know, I hate to have to say it, but it's almost like somebody is just looking at it with greedy eyes, like a vulture saying, ooh, let's just tear this up and do something. It has forgotten that it has this entire ecosystem that lives there beyond the humans. The humans are what we see, and the humans are who it's there to serve. But do those humans know what's about to happen or what could happen? So for those of us that do know, as members of civil society, we have a voice. We should, we should use it, I believe, and it needs to be heard. But I just think that that's coming back to it. That's the fair judicial process that should happen, especially as the folks that are coming in to invest in it are also members of civil society. They're not administrative. They're not government. They're not the military. They're one of us. So you think that they would be receptive to what somebody on their side is wanting to be heard and taken into account. So that I think is, you know, it's such a precious space in so many, so many ways. I mean, I've lifted just a few off the top of my head, but I'm sure if we, if we go deeper, I will find more things going on underneath the surface of what I've just described. We should multiply this. We want more spaces like this across the city. There's no reason to change this and take away from it and lose that history of what it was. In fact, that history should be replicated as a model in many other new parks all over the city that are desperate for attention, desperate for money, desperate for financial investment, de desperate to be fixed. So I think that that, that would be my, my uh, concern as a child growing up in the city and having come back to it. To, and it's not that I'm saying don't change it. Certainly make the necessary improvements. The heavy hand versus the sensitive, light, humane hand. That's really what I think that our architectural heritage sites around them, they all need. Nobody wants a Ritz-Carlton built next to Mohenjo-daro or, or um, Takhbahi or, you know, the Jain temples in but you want to do gentle structures. You don't want these monsters of concrete and iron and steel that sit there and peer down onto these ancient sites with this incredible wisdom and stories and mythologies and energy. You want it to nurture more of it and bring out more of its natural beauty, its heritage beauty, and allow more people to come there. There's another site in the city, Empress Market, where gentrification took place. And they put a fence up. Of course, that's ruined it because it didn't have a fence before. And it had all these hawkers. And it was dirty. And it was lively. And, you know, they were homeless lying around. And it was fine. You want to get rid of the encroachment? You want to get rid of the people who are misusing the space? Agreed. There's an excellent example in Mumbai for Bindi, Bindi Bazaar, where there's this very, very gradual uh, removal and encroachment happening and development happening. It's not an overnight surgery that comes in and sort of shocks the system. Now there's these lawns, these green manicured, like golf course gardens where there were people who earned a living, people who earned livings there from the little hawker system for generations. People who had little pieces of paper saying, here's my rental payment that I've paid every year for 47, 57 years. And they've just been ejected. 
So that has left a really scary and bitter taste in everybody's mouth that God forbid something like that happens here. And even in the cleaning of that building, they use the fire hoses to sandblast a sandstone building, which is damaging its surface, making it more prone to rain being absorbed and it becoming brittle and damaged. Thank God for our dear friend Marvi, who created a stink and I think that was stopped single-handedly thanks to her from what I know. But you know, one shouldn't have to take such extreme measures for something that's a shared space amongst all of us. We all share, it belongs to all of us. We're all its users in some way or the other, even if I'm driving past. I don't want to see a dead space that's exclusive with nobody there, no children running around, no frisbees, no cricket, you know, no musicians playing their little guitar or flute or whatever it may be. We want to see all of that, even if you drive past. So I think the voice of civil society plays a role here and, and, and it's a role as important as the users of the gardens and as important as the restoration of the building and the washing of the greens and keeping it clean, all of that, making sure the stray dogs are not killed for any reason. You know, all of that, I think we all play a role in this. Well, my favorite way to begin. Well, I think you've really hit on <coughs> a possibility, civil society, and what that means. And you've just expressed it you feel a responsibility toward the rest of the society, whether it's in Karachi, whether the person comes from outside. Civil society is a re reciprocity, a responsibility for each other. Not, oh, we have a police force, they'll take care of things. You know, if, if uh, you're being attacked and somebody's sitting there that could help you. Oh, well, get the police, call the police rather than interceding. And that sense, and I call it responsibility, how to respond and the natural feeling. So yes, you get a pleasure from all these people because you're responding to them. You're not feeling different or othering or our recently favorite word from Kimberly. So that's gone. I'm sorry to say. I'm very sorry to say. So the group of people, and there's such a huge number of them that I can't even believe it. Millionaires, billionaires, people with lots of money no longer feel it's their responsibility to give back. They don't feel that. Now, as much as we might criticize Carnegie, for instance. Carnegie made his money in the 19th century from railroads and extending them across the continent. And we, you know, we know what happens when you extend railroads, you build towns, there's lots of income coming in, supplies can be taken out. But he also put money into the public library system all across the United States. Things aren't so easy. You're not either on one side or the other. It's how we respond to each other. So that's missing. If I make a ton of money today, it's to glorify me, 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 me. I'll have my own private jet. I've forgotten what city, I think it was in Brazil, maybe Rio. There are people with their own private helicopters. They can go shopping in the city and then you know fly out. Same thing all over the world. You know, I don't, it's like Robert Moses. He doesn't drive, but he builds all these highways so the very rich don't have to see what lies between Long Island, Connecticut, and the center of Manhattan. But my point is you are talking about civil society and you're asking this question, where is it? Will you still feel that, again, Here's, what, here's my favorite habit. Take off the R-E and what's the rest of the, what's the root of the word? Spontaneity. It's not calculated. It's in you. And, you know, we could talk and talk and try and figure out why, 
but that won't be necessarily the reason why anybody else listening to us. If they hear a child crying, they run right over and protect it. A crane fell on a bus stop in New York City, not far from my apartment. And a woman there grabbed her baby, saved his life and ran away. And everybody thought, well, that's the baby's mother. But it wasn't, it wasn't. You know, it's like, what's your spontaneous impulse? And that's been broken. The trees are all knitted together, their roots. A stump of a tree can live for two or three years after the rest of the tree is gone because it's supported by the root system. So this support system, the civil society, is something that, is missing and I think it's it's what causes the question that you have and the question I have is why why isn't this being really discussed why aren't we responding and seeing that there are all these other empty spaces in the city and they're interconnected and people well, everybody should have access where they can get cleaner air where they can be next to each other without fear, where they can feel the wind, where they, like you said, your body opens. That was a spontaneous communication that you just gave. You know, in other words, it's something that you realize your body did. And, and civil society rests on that. It's part of almost every traditional society. They don't call it civil society but they had numerous ways, not through buying and selling, when they all joined and celebrated and came together as a group without differentiation. I, I, we don't have enough time for me to explain, but I think you know what I mean, that there were all these ways to strengthen what is spontaneously there. You hear a dog, crying the puppy here got her his foot caught in a gate and nobody was around and every you know everybody realized what that's not a bark to get out of here that's a bark of pain and we all rush you know whatever signal a any a tree you can see a tree that's suffocating from too many vines what's your spontaneous feeling and what action does it lead to? Lead to? So I, I... Uh, sorry, just because yeah, we have yeah, a short yeah. time. Essentially, um, you've been a social activist and an ecological activist, and I know the history and all the phenomenal work you've done. I think, in terms of the spontaneity, this is a, an opportunity for civil society to gather, to come together, and actually make their voices heard and stop anything that's going to be planned for the fair hall that's inappropriate, unnecessary, heavy-handed, or damaging to its existing culture, be it walls or tickets or replacing relocation of trees, whatever it may be. This is when civil society has to come together and ask for transparency and ask for uh, information to be shared with all of us uh, in multiple languages across the city so that everybody knows what's about to happen or what could happen and share their opinion on it and maybe help with some of the decision making as well. So I think that's, that would be probably a good point to stop this for now. And I will report back on how civil society has matured and come forward uh, in terms of not only this project, but other similar projects where architectural heritage sites are under scrutiny by big business owners and by private investors to try and figure out what to do with them. This could be just one of many, but I thought it's a beautiful building. It's a great space. We could talk about it today. So. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much for that, Jean. Uh, I know there's a lot of information that you have been through and you've kindly shared with us today. Anybody else who's on here who's interested in the project, uh, drop us a DM or comments. Uh, thank you for joining us. If you have any information on what's happening at the fair or what you'd like to see happen, let me know. I'd be happy to take it on board. And if you'd like to be part of the civil society voice, definitely let me know. Thank you so much. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you, Jean. Have a great day. Good night. Office to everybody else. Till next time. Take care of yourself.